Uh, sorry, welcome to Expedition Church of the Triad, where we know how to operate electronic equipment. Hallelujah. <laughs> I remember talking away, you're going. All right. We are continuing with, uh, with last week's sermon. We're going to finish that, that up this week. Uh, could be in content with life or finding contentment with life. Um, Philippians 4, 11 through 13 is our foundation text for what we're teaching. And out of the Amplified Bible, we read, not that I am implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content, that is, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted in what's, whatever state I am. I know how to be abased and live humbly in straightened circumstances, and I know how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or being in want. I have strength for all things in Christ who, empow who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ sufficiency. sufficiency. 20th century New Testament says, do not think that I am saying this under the pressure of want, for I, however I am placed, have learned to be independent of the circumstances. Key, key phrase there. That's, that's why I like the 20th century. You know, there's some translations that might be one phrase in one chapter of one book that just does it for you. In the 20th century, this is it. I have learned to be independent of the circumstances. Glory to God. And um, I... That Janie looked one day and found a few years ago a copy, a, 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 a um, copy of the 20th century New Testament. Had been rebound, but it was a, it was an original 19, early 1900 copy um, that they they had re, you know, rebound it because it was the cover tore all up. So um, I ha it, it smells old. <laughs> Hallelujah! But I have it. Glory to God! Glory to God! Hallelujah! Learning to be independent of the circumstances. Now, we talked about last week how Paul had learned um, to be sufficient in Christ's sufficiency, that uh, materialism and circumstance, external circumstances do not bring joy or satisfaction with life, um, that our dissatisfaction comes often because we're looking to those things to fulfill us. And we need to be fulfilled in Christ. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And so we got down here, and uh, we read, oh, I think we read chapter 11 and most of chapter 12 of uh, first, uh, Second Corinthians talking about Paul saying he had been this, you know, talking about all the things he had gone through. Hallelujah. But, he, he, you know, I love he, how Paul talks. He, he talks about this. Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors. I like that kind of talk. Not, well, you know, we're learning something in this difficult place that we're in. These sorrows and pains teach us, you know. No. In all these things, I'm more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. And all, in all these things, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. Now, we're not talking, you know, some people, I've, I've, I've recently read some people, they're, they're, they're going along and talking about how that sorrow teaches us. And without sorrows, you know, this and that. Without, you know, sorrows. And this this well, it's been a word of faith, Rhema person. Yeah, that's what I said. Really? <clears throat> but Paul, Paul looked at all those things. He listed all the things he went through. And then he, tells, uh, he says in one place, I've he says here in this very chapter, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. I mean, over, over Philippians 4. Romans, he says, and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. I am persuaded. Paul says, then neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor, you know, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any other thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen? It doesn't say, Paul was not a mealy mouth, you know, sorrows teaching you a lesson thing. Even when he talked about the thorn that was given to him here in 1 Corinthians, um, chapter uh, 11, 12, that's actually chapter 12, um, or 2 Corinthians 12. Um, he says it was given unto him the messenger of, messenger of Satan, sent to buffet him, lest he be exalted above measure. And then he said this. He said, because I besought the Lord three times that he might remove this from me. 
And he said, uh, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, you could take that the old-fashioned, you know, way. Yes. Yes, oh, I just need to suffer. You know? And when I'm the weakest, God's strength is made. And, and what, what they, they put this twist on it of defeat. And what Paul was really saying was that when I get to the end of Paul, when I've, when I've exhausted Paul, <coughs> when the circumstances of life have come against me and Paul can't do anything else, my grace is sufficient for you. I will therefore rather rejoice in those things that the power of Christ. No. Well, what does the power come for? Why does the power come? Hello? See, we, we want to limit the power to giving us the ability to bear up under it. Now, the Bible does talk about being, you know, having sufficiency. You know, the Bible does talk about being able to, be, to bear up under it. But to bear up under something. How many of you ever had to hold something heavy over your head? Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the things I hate worse than anything on the planet, besides uh, taking out a barn of um, sand lugs. If you ever put it in the back, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. The guy on the bottom is the one that they take all the, all the older guys who've done tobacco before. They go to the top of the barn to take out sand lugs and put you on the bottom. Why? Because that's the first harvesting, priming. We call it priming. Priming backup off the bottom, and it's got all the dirt on it. Or well, they hang it in the barn, and it dries out, and you start shaking those to sticks to take them down. All that falls. Well, guess who gets hit in the face? The guy on the bottom. So the, who gets on the bottom? The rookie. He's always given the bottom. He, you know, because you'll, you'll, the other guys, they'll, they'll, they'll shoot right up the tears and be up at the top of the barn and hanging down. But you down on the bottom, and, and you can't even look up. You got your hat turned over your eyes, you know, and you reach it up and grab it and, and hand it outside the barn, and you're getting covered. <coughs> it's running all down your shirt. If you look up, they say, hey, you look up right in your eyes. The second thing I hate, not equal to that, but this next thing in line is hanging sheetrock over your head. Now they got these fancy sheetrock lifts. You crank them up and put it in place and go, nye, 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 nye. I've, I've hung sheetrock over my head, one hand holding it, your head holding it, trying to get the screw up in there and get it in one spot and then get another screw on it where you hadn't let go because if you let go, it's going to drop, it's going to pull that one out. The sheetrock just snatch it out. And you're trying to do all that. Okay. Bearing up under something, the weight of something, okay, is difficult. Well, God's going to give you strength to bear up under it. But how, do, how, what kind of strength does he give you? See, when we study God, we find out that he's exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or even think. He's more than enough. Amen. So when we bear up, <coughs> we are not bearing up, barely hanging on. You know, holding on by the skin of your teeth, hoping you're going to make it somehow, some way, somehow, some way. Somehow, some way. Oh, God, let me hold on by some hook or crook. You know? <coughs> no. When Christ's strength infuses you, hello? You're Charles Atlas under there. So when you're bearing up, you're standing in the strength of God, meaning this. What did Jesus say? He said this. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that's what the master said. I don't care which blogger said. The master said, My yoke is easy. What's it mean? What's a yoke? Y'all know what it is. It's a, it's a farm implement thing, an anna for, for beast of burden. You yoke them together. So they walk in harmony and lockstep one with the other. So you, you, you call her one and you call her the other. And now they are forced to walk together because of the yoke. And their strength is increased. I forgot the, the amount. A Clydesdale, <coughs> I think a Clydesdale could singularly pull 
like 6,000 pounds. But yoked together, I, I saw some number, and I, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but not much, like 20,000 pounds. Now, wait a second. Individually, it was, it was six. Together, it was almost 20. Yeah, that's what I say. Wow. So you're going through life, you know, under this burden, and Christ comes and says, you're heavy laden and you're burdened. I'm going to yoke with you, and now my yoke is easy, your burden is light, and you walk through that thing as, as if it was nothing. Not that it wasn't nothing, but you're walking through it in his strength and in his power. Absent of him is crushing you. Yoked in him, becomes, it becomes a light burden. Are you here? See, see, we, we, need, we need to stay focused on what the Word teaches and not your stinking New Age millennial opinions. You know, I've learned so much. What did you learn? Apparently from what you're writing, stupidity. Hello. You know. Paul, after Paul went through all the things he went through, he said, I learned to be independent of the circumstances. He didn't say, I learned, you know, that sorrow was teaching me something. He said, I learned to be independent. They don't affect me. Hello? Amen. I said, amen. His word is life. Amen. Glory to God. So, what was Paul's attitude about things? Let's go to 1 Timothy. Now, if, we, if we're covering something we have covered last week, that's okay. It's all right to cover something more than once. It's all right to cover something more than twice. And it's all right to cover it several times. I think we, we did read some of this yet last week. And um, hallelujah. That's okay. Okay? Because it'll lead us into it. We're going to wrap this up. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, what is a contentment according to the 20th century New Testament? Being independent of the circumstances. In other words, because you don't have a $400,000, 3,200-square-foot 3, home, you're not sitting around depressed every day. Okay? And because you've got a $400,000, 3,200-square-foot 3, home, you're not sitting around just, whoo, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm so complete because I got this house. That circumstance shouldn't govern and we said ex external things should not be governing how you are functioning. Amen? You should be you in Christ all the time. Amen? All right. Then he goes on and says this, Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. In other words, you know, get your eyes off the material possessions. Having food, having raiment, having something to eat, being clothed, that's a good thing. We want you clothed. Some folks, we definitely don't want you unclothed. I mean, there, did you all know that one of the beaches near Cape Canaveral is, is a nudist beach in Florida? It's public. It's national park land, and there's no law against it on the National Park Service. So people go out there, and what, why are you out there showing yourself? Ain't nobody want to look at you. Hello? I wouldn't want to go out there. I wouldn't go out there and be naked anyway, but I don't want to go out there and see it either. It amazes me some of the people who think they want to expose themselves to everybody, and you're thinking, my God, cover up. Not because I'm offended by it as a Christian. It's just you need to cover up. <laughs> Hello? Your tattoo is done, you know, drop from your, your shoulder down to your elbows. Glory. I ain't going to say glory. I say glory. Huh? Help us, Jesus. Um, yeah, we did read all this last week because I remember I've seen this now. Um, but they which will be rich, pursue riches, fall into a temptation and snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. We talked about this last week. How that when you start pursuing riches, and that's the problem with some of the prosperity teaching, um, is we got people on getting rich instead of a, instead of 
tithing, giving, receiving from God according to his word, the blessings of the tither and the giver. All they could think about was, I'm going to get into the get rich seminar and I'm going to give to the prosperity preacher, get my thousand fold return, and I'm going to live, you know, debt free. Now, they always will throw in there, and we're going to help the kingdom. They really don't think about, they ain't thinking about helping the kingdom. They're thinking about their Lamborghini. Talked about that last week, okay? Uh, for the love of money, or as we said last week, the, 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 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Like we said, there's, there's evil out there that has nothing to do with money, okay? There is. It has, it has not, not a thing to do with money. But the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, all right? Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through many sorrows. But thou, O man, flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Look what he says. Follow after what? Well, one thing he didn't put in there is money. righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, and then fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, let's go here. So we, we understand where Paul's coming from. Um, let's, let's, let's discuss where Paul's contentment came from. Where did it come from? If it's not coming from external circumstances, where is it coming from? You see, we are a spirit. We possess a soul. We live in a body. As, as believers, we are to, um, there's a little course we used to sing. Some of y'all remember, some of you have never, maybe have never heard it. I got something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a joy in my life. I got something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a joy in my life. And I don't know where it goes. It's, that's basically the chorus. There's something internal that is to work its way out. What a lot of people are doing is they're trying to get the inner joy and the inner peace by going, I got something on the outside, working to the inside. Bring some joy into my life. So you got it backwards. You got it backwards. It has to, it, it has to originate, folks. Say this with me. Say, it must. it must. The joy, the victory, the happiness I seek starts on the inside and works its way to the outside. Amen. Glory to God. That's where it has to be. It has to be an inner work. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why Paul was able to say, I'm independent of the circumstances. Because having too much or not having enough is not where I am gaining my joy from. It's coming from an inner work. What is that work? It is communion with Christ. It is being in harmony with God. It's being in, in uh, intimate fellowship with the Father. Hallelujah. It's not because of the car. Because <clears throat> you know this, I can tell you this, you can get the car, and as soon as it gets a scratch on it, it it's ain't the same. <laughs> now tell me, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Something happens when that gets a scratch on it. It just robs you of all that, especially if you just bought it. I know you're one of those that parked out there in the parking lot, 45 you know, sp spaces out there into the middle of nowhere, taking up three spaces at a crooked angle, and some smart bozo comes in and parks on both sides of it so you can't get out because they think it's funny. Now, if you're way out there doing that, I, I, now if you're up there at the front doing that, now yeah, yeah now that's, that's wrong. Okay. Paul said, remember, for Philippians 4.13, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. 2 Corinthians 9, we might not be real long tonight, but then again, I can't promise you. When it comes to how long Pastor Ed preaches, there are no rules. How many figured that out by now? And let me tell you, we got into this building, and that spirit came back. <laughs> You know, 
I mean, it did. It used to be, well, we were getting down in 45 minutes, you know, and like, okay, we're about done. You know, got to get out of here. And that, it came back and brought seven more worse than the first one. <laughs> yeah, we're going to fill up a DVD. Oh, forget it. A terabyte thumb drive. Hallelujah. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. God is able, listen to this, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Hallelujah. Amen. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Being enriched in everything to the bountifulness which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Hallelujah. But look back here. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So what, what are the blessings of God about? Here it says to abound in every good work. See, God wants to bless you and all sufficiency in all things so you can abound in every good work, not in every possession. Folks, as this, as this thing is wrapping up in the world, it's going to take more than the fact you've got a Lamborghini and the power tie to win the lost. Amen. I mean, when you read some of these missionaries like uh, Christopher Long, um, who was, had, his own family had him arrested. His dad was a general in the Pakistani army. And he was going to be beheaded because his own family charged him with converting to Christianity. And then you're upset because you didn't get, and I'm, not, I'm talking in general, to our circles. This isn't the whole church, but it's, a lot of people in our circles were like this. They're upset that they didn't get, you know, a brand new 2023, you know, whatever car. And as we said before, as we've been, say, we've been talking along this line, and the Lord's not letting me get off of this, folks. Listen, I'd love to be in here going, money cometh to me now in Jesus' name. Bye-bye, chickens. We're leaving the chicken yard because we're eagles. Never going to know debt ever again. Okay, that's more fun to preach. People get more excited about it. They do. They'll give bigger offerings. Because there's a, there is a, there's a hint, there is a empowerment an implication made that this gospel message is going to make you rich and you ain't never going to have to work and you ain't never going to need anything. You're just going to live like you want to live all the time. I heard that Hagen. Um, people, were, people were taking something Brother Hagen was saying. He, he, he talked about, he's, you know, they, he said, I'm, I'm believing God for a one-time gift, $5,000. And he said, and when that happened, he doubled it up. I believe in God for one time gift of $10,000. And he kept going up and kept going up and finally got to a million dollars. He used his faith to build. Now, I heard a lot of people take that message and go out and start saying, I'm believing God for one, for one time gift. For me personally, not for the church, not for the ministry, not for what we're doing, but for me personally. And started doing it for themselves. Not that that's necessarily wrong. But see, I think something was lost in the translation between what Brother Hagin was doing and what they were doing. Because then when I heard, because I had heard people teach this, and I had, I had never heard Brother Hagin say anything about it. And I got to listen to one of the old tape one time, and he was on there. And he got to the million dollars, and he said this. And what are you going to do with that? I'll tell you what we're going to do with it. We're going to go on more television stations. We're going to go on more radio stations. We're going to print more books. We're going to reach more people for the kingdom. And the purpose of all of that do you hear me? Was the ministry. Was reaching people. Now, why was he, why would God bless him? Because he knew that he wasn't pursuing money just so he could have wealth. He was wanting the money to do the work. 
So you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be careful, but I, I can't really be too careful because we need to deal with this and continue to deal with it until people get it and start really believing God for prosperity to fund the gospel. Amen? Like I said last week, there's enough money out there to pay our building off tomorrow. Honestly, we take 135 people and send $1,000 to our church, we'd be debt, we'd debt, debt free. Well, then we can start saving money to build a bigger building to do more, to reach more. But I'm just saying, the money, there's money out there. But am I going to take it and get, well, we're just trying to get $135,000 so I can get a really nice car. Now, I want, I want you know, listen. When we got the car we have now, it's a 2016 Jeep Cherokee. When we got that car, we needed another car. Honest, honest, we, we needed a car. My Jeep wasn't running all that great, and then, of course, Nathan got it and blew the engine. But I asked, I asked the, the mechanic, I said, could anything, but he said, no, that was going to happen. It was just one of those things, it was, it was going to happen. And, I mean, it, it threw the rod through the oil pan. When he got it out of the car and all that stuff, there was a crack in the block that big, that long, and about that wide. I mean, it blew it. <laughs> there, was, there was no fixing the engine. So we got a salvage engine that had 70,000 miles less on it than the car had on it. Okay. And, um, but there's, I, I, I'm going to sell, I got need to sell it because it's got, needs a water pump, needs a radiator and uh, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's 22 years old, you know, and I don't want to just keep throwing money in it, you know, this, at this point. So anyway, um, but when we got to that, that car Jeep we have now, we were, we were like, we need a new vehicle. We need a new vehicle. Not necessarily brand new. We just needed a new ve another nicer, newer vehicle to be able to get around. And um, we went and we found that one. It was a program car. It wasn't brand new. It was actually ni it's, it's nicer or whatever. Than we they kept trying to, uh, the dealerships tried to keep, tried to keep selling me a four-cylinder. You might love four-cylinders. I don't like four-cylinders. Because when I go boom, I want it to go shoo. I don't want it to go kick the fleet out and put the Flintstone feet down and go blah, 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 blah. Okay? I want to move. When I'm getting on the interstate, I don't want to hear the engine going, Nee! Okay? The wheel's barely turning. You're going, Nee! You're inside, you're going here, and it going, Nee! People outside looking at the wheels go, You know? And you can't get on the ramp because you can't get at the road speed quick enough. And, you know, and I like my little six-cylinder Jeep out there. Because you know what? I put it down. 3.2 liter V6. I mean, inline. No, it's a V6. It's not an inline. V6, my old Jeep had an inline six. Anyway, people shoot over them, them, them engines. They love those engines. Unless you blow it. Okay. So we, we go in and we, we work with the dealership. We're looking at one. And he, he can't get to our price. We go over to Crown, and they, they get us into the vehicle. And I'll never forget. Then all my kids went and bought new ones. The next night and the same day, the next day, they all went and got the Jeeps, and Nathan got the Compass and all that kind of stuff. But I'll never forget as we were driving off. Because, we, we, you know, we were just, it wasn't we were trying to be prosperity to people. <clears throat> we had to have a, a dependable vehicle because I was just getting old and they weren't dependable. You know, you didn't really want to leave town with them. You know, anybody ever had that? You just didn't want to leave town with it. You were just concerned that, you know, it, was gonna, it, it, it could break down on you on the road because it's just got, it's getting old. And um, the Lord spoke to me. He said, this is the beginning. Listen, we were, in, we were in trouble. The church was in debt and, and that was on us because our name was on it. I mean, we didn't, we didn't qualify for a doodly squat. I didn't even qualify for the Flintstone mobile. But we got it. And the Lord said, this is the beginning of the turnaround for you. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, you know, that's 2016. It was 2016. And tw three and, and uh, a half years later, the church is completely out of debt. I mean, you know, I mean, completely out of debt. We're in way better financial. Because when that got out of debt, it took all that off of our, our, 
All the places where my social security number was on all that stuff was gone. It was, it was at zero. You know, just, just, and, and we weren't trying to, you know, like right now, I, I'm, you know, this, now this one has gotten older. We've had it since 2016. It's 20, 2023. It's seven years old. Um, it's the best of all three vehicles I've gotten. The other two, I wouldn't. And then the window fell down in my car, my Jeep again today. Not my Jeep, my van. I went to roll it up from going to the storage unit, and the window went, chink. You heard something pop in there, so the regulator um, cable broke. You hear it grinding in there. You know, oh, that's not good. That wasn't good. You know, and I'm trying to get it to come up, and then uh, Jesse's trying to pull the button so I can get, slide it up to get it up high enough to see if it'll lock it. And when I let it go, it went, shoop. It's drizzling rain, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, um, and my old Jeep is just, it's not running. I need to get it running so I can sell it. You know, I'm going to get it running and sell it. You know, somebody wants to have it as a project and, you know, um, it's got all new front end except for the wheel bearings. It's got, you know, re, re, a re-manned um, engine, a, a, a salvage engine. It had all the new parts put on. It's just, that's just a block. Salvage engine was just a block. Then they buy the kit to put on, to put all the stuff on it. Okay, and um, good tires on it, good body, you know, so, but I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to put any more money in it. If somebody who wants to, they can, all right, you know, want, want BT for their kid in college, great vehicle, all right, um, but we're going to start, we're going to start looking for another vehicle, but I go, I go look, Lord Jesus, what I want is $75,000, and right now, I just don't see me doing that. You know, and I'm not going to go into the church for the church. Yeah, brother Larry, Jerry, you know, never know. God might speak to you, <laughs> tell you to dip into your retirement and give me a down payment of forty-five thousand dollars on that vehicle. Phone number is three one four five eight three four. Okay, can't do that. Number one, I I just can't. I can't. That's almost as much as my first house. You know. And, uh, well, you, you don't have any faith. No. I need to put my faith in places that are more important than that, that type of a car. Now, maybe later, if it's, if it's, you know, it's really functional on another level and we're getting all that done, then but, but I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay? So now I've backed down. I mean, I'm like, do I want to use one that's, that's in really good shape, got some miles on it, but not nearly as much as what I got on my other one? That's like a kind of a cream puff kind of thing. You know, um, and get it for half, you know, or more, ha less than half, um, you know, and, and still have it, you know. Well, so I'm, I'm looking at all my options, but I, I'm not going to trade my Jeep because that needs to become my secondary car. You see what I'm saying? And so I'm I'm not going to sit around all day long and just talk about I I believe that I receive, you know, uh, a 2000 a 2023. And listen, I know this sounds like I'm against what we've taught in the past. What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to do is swing the pendulum back a little bit out of this excess and get it back over here where we are more focused on the kingdom and advancing the kingdom than we are being super blessed with everything on the planet our little heart desires and letting people go to hell in the process. That all we can, all, the only reason we can fill up a church is because they're going to, they're under the guise they're going to get rich tonight with the special anointing, the special thousandfold anointing, instead of we're going to fill the altars up tonight and bring keep people into the kingdom, get people filled with the Holy Ghost, get them healed in their bodies, cast some devils out, glory to God. Amen. Amen. Do the works of Jesus. And you can do the works of Jesus in a rattle trap or in a brand new Lamborghini. You can still do the works of Jesus. So, so all I am saying here is let's, you know, let's continue to take inventory of our attitude. Amen. Now, do not go home with the way all your prosperity books. And don't say, well, I can't confess that anymore. That's not what I'm saying. Let's just make an adjustment. You remember Dad Hagen said this one time? He said, you know, um, he went to the Lord. You know, because, I mean, he's out there preaching, doing what the Lord told him to do, sharing, you know, traveling. And um, he's ba he barely gets, I mean, sometimes uh, the, they're, they're almost, they're going without until he can get home with a little bit of money to pay some bills and to buy some groceries. 
on the road. And he's out traveling, going everywhere. And, um, and then, he, um, then he, went, the Lord, he went to pastor. He started pastoring instead of traveling. And while he was pastoring, it got really bad. It got really bad. Okay? And somewhere in all this, um, they were so bad, he went to the Lord and said, Lord, now Isaiah 119 says that if you uh, be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. He said, now, Lord, I'm not eating the good of the land. I'm barely getting by here. And the Lord said, that's because you weren't, you weren't willing. He said, you were obedient, all right, but you weren't willing. Okay? So he was doing what the Lord told him to do, but his heart was somewhere else. So see, this is what we're talking about. we got to get the hearts right. He said, Lord, you dealt me a low blow. <laughs> okay? He said, you've been, you've been obedient, all right, but you weren't willing. He said, okay. He said, right down here on the inside, I made a little adjustment. He said, all right, Lord, I'm willing. I expect to eat the good of the land. And he said, you know, I did. It changed. And that's what I'm talking about. We got to make adjustments right down in here. It's not a big, it's not a big thing. It's make, making sure we approach this from the right perspective. God wants you to have. God wants to, you are his children. Every bit of that is true. There's, there's no but on it. That is true. The but comes when that moves into lascivious excess and you're leaving, reaching the lost and doing the works of Jesus and carrying the gospel to the nations out. You see? So the teaching, <coughs> God wants you blessed. The tither is blessed. The giver is blessed. God wants you to walk in the land of plenty. All true. But if that attitude is off, and you're leaving out this other side that is equally or more important. And I would, I would go and venture to say more important. Then you're missing it because you put the emphasis in the wrong place. So don't burn your books. Don't discard, don't erase all your tape series. Now the ones where they come out and say tithe these out for the church today and they used to teach on tithing, burn the new ones. Okay, that, you know, tithe is not for the church. Say, go ahead and burn that one. Erase it. Get a degausser on your computer. Wipe it out. All right? Don't listen to that stupidity. All right. Now, um, second, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. I, I know we read some of this stuff last week, but we're just re recover, recovering ground here. You know, listen, I, 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 can I tell you something? I went to Ramah. Did y'all know that? <laughs> and and we, had, we had what we called Faith Library. Now, we were in four, four eight-week or four nine-week sessions. I can't, I can't remember which it was now. Four nine-week sessions during the school year. And during those four whatevers, one semester or one, one grade, one period or whatever, it's not even a quarter, it's a, it's a whatever. It's not even a quarter system. It's, it's, it was in fourths. You had Faith Library three days a week, and the second year students had it two days a week. And the next block, next set of weeks, it switched. First year students had it two days a week, then three days a week. And, and they did that. So during the year, you had two full things of five days a week, Brother Hagen. Okay, so that's what I added that to. Half the year was five, five days of Brother Hagen teaching. Okay? Every single class. Open your Bibles to Mark, the 11th chapter. And you think after hearing him that many times, you think, how can he still come up with something different on Mark 11, 22, and 23, and 24? And he did. Hello. So there's, there's wealth in, in stuff, and wealth in recovering ground. Okay? How many of you ever, how many of you ever walked a path somewhere, a park or a trail? And all of a sudden, you see something on your 300th time down that trail you've never seen before, and it's been there the whole time. Okay? Same thing with the Bible. We can go down the same trail hundreds of times. Let me give you an example, a, a natural example today. I was in here. Um, <clears throat> the chair I bought for my office when I first, we first moved in here was horrible. It was like sitting on bricks. 
and it wouldn't roll because it broke the wheels the first time I used it. So I had, every time I tried to pull it at my desk, I had to get up, pull the chair up, and sit back down because the wheels, and I tried to replace them, but they didn't make that size because it's from, it's from China, and they used a weird size, and they don't make a replacement for it. Can't use it. So I tried to buy some. I tried to make them go in there. It bent the whole chassis. So now I'm leaning. Uncomfortable, leaning, can't roll. I threw it in the dumpster and got another chair. Yeah, like, okay. <laughs> and it matches better anyway. That one was black. The, the new one's brown. The chairs in there brown. It matches the color in there better anyway. <coughs> it is so much more comfortable. <coughs> Padded, comfy. Ooh. So I was here today putting it together while they were delivering the uh, thing out there, putting it up after I took 200 pictures. Why did I take 200 pictures? Because my wife called and said, take pictures. And being the wise husband that I am, I took pictures and video. Watching that really cool trailer they had. And we'll talk about that another day. And so I had my glasses. I had my readers because I don't, I don't have to have glasses like, you know, to, to see. I need them to read. Like, like right now, right now I can actually stand back here and, and read. But if I get closer, I can't see. I can't. Because that's, that that's the dynamic of, uh, you know, um, cataract replacement. You know, it, it doesn't focus in and out like your, your natural lens is getting. But I can see. See, the nice thing is I can see. I was driving and couldn't see. I mean, I look at a speed limit sign. It was, it was, I knew it was a speed limit sign because it was white with some numbers on it. It looked like. I couldn't tell what they were. I was 2,400 in that eye. 2,400, 2,040 in this one going down. And then Jay, I told Jamie one day, I said, no, I couldn't even see that. She said, and I was riding with you. <laughs> so anyway, I was in here working, and I took my readers off and set them in a chair back here. And came in, and I needed them to do something. Oh, I was looking at instructions on how to put that together. They actually had words. Yeah, words. And uh, where are my readers? I walked around the church, looked down the rows. Went outside, went out back where I'd been, been do, doing some stuff out there while they were, try, they were trying to get it in there. Looked, went out to my car, went around everywhere, looking at some of the craziest places, like maybe I set them down. And I remembered when I set them down today, I went, you shouldn't put them there. You should pick them up and put them somewhere else. And I was just in a hurry because I think, I think they were driving up at the time. And I was trying to get out there to get to them. And I walked around in this sanctuary, looking down the aisles, looking under the seats, and finally just gave up and went back to work. And I'm, and I'm working up here and kind of doing something. And, and, I, and I come back here and I'm, I'm going, I'm not even really looking. I look down and there they're sitting right there. Right there. They were there the whole time. I just kept walking by it and not seeing it. And so there's many times we go down the, the path of Scripture that we, we're not even, and all of a sudden we see something new. We see it for the first time. Something set in a way. That open, we go, oh, I get it. Amen. So it's, it's, it's fine to recover and keep going over the same ground. Because I needed to keep going over the ground. And when I finally stopped looking for it, kind of, I won't even think about it. I look down. How did I miss? I asked myself, how did you miss that? I mean, they're obviously there. I remember those, um, those, those, those geometric things that when you look at them, they look like this weird geometric. But when you stand there long enough and let your eyes focus at a different whatever, all of a sudden it becomes a 3D picture. You know, my dad has one of the, uh, the Statue of Liberty and the, and the Twin Towers. And I'll go to his garage and I'll stand in there and go, you know, cross your eyes, do all this stuff, you know. And all of a sudden, it was there the whole time. I just couldn't see it because I wasn't focusing right. Amen. All right, look at 1, 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So much for the earlier service. <laughs> Y'all didn't believe me when I said it the first time, did you? All right. Paul writes here, and why can you be content? He says, let's, look at what he says. Let's back up just a little bit. For which cause we faint not? But though our outward man perish, 
yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our, listen to this, listen to what Paul says, our light affliction. Have you read what he said? Perils in the city, perils in the country, perils among my own countrymen, perils among the heathen, three days and night in the deep. I mean, he goes on and on and on and on and on and on. That don't sound like light affliction. <clears throat> but Paul saw it as light affliction. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, external, but at the things which are not seen, internal. For the things which are seen are temporal. Now, temporal really just simply means subject to change. It's passing. It's fleeting. It's momentary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. Paul learned his secret by going and saying, I don't need to look at the external. I look at the internal. Because the internal is eternal. And the external is transient. It's changeable. It's subject to change. The internal is forever. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Amen. Amen? Glory to God. So we come and we begin to understand that when we lay hold of the eternal and live in the eternal and walk in the eternal, then the temporal has to align. It will, it will begin to align. Hallelujah. Because we didn't let it move us off course. Because we were looking to the we were looking to the temporal, which was changeable. We know we all know about fair weather friends, don't you? We all know about you know, uh, come on, come on down, do be da ba down. You know, breaking up is hard to do. Don't take your love. Yeah, you in love one day and hate each other the next. Well, because it's it's all based on emotion, feeling, external. You know, somebody better looking came along and looked at her and she thought he looked better than you. So you're dumped. OK, if you're if your whole world was built on that external thing, you're in trouble. But when you learn and I'm just I'm just trying to use some some silly stuff. But, you know, we, we could apply this to all kinds of things, you know, um, this you can even get to it. Let's uh, OK. I've got all these thoughts running. I'm trying to grab hold of one that's really out there. When I am. Um, and I'm going to close here. When I graduated from Rhema, I fully thought, <laughs> here I come. I am God's man of faith and power. I've listened to WBZQ in Greenville, North Carolina. I've heard all that Brother Copeland had to say. I've heard all that Brother Hagen had to say. And right in between the, the Copeland Hagen hour was the Bill Bailey radio show. What was it called? The Spirit of Faith or? Yeah, the Spirit of Faith broadcast with Bill Bailey. What Dr. Bill back then? Hello. And Brother Bill was good on the radio. Got a radio voice anyway. So it was like, you know, this is great. Got Copeland, Hagen, and Bailey. I don't know how we could put that into a, 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 a parity of the uh, chewing tobacco. But anyway, you know, we have Copeland Hagen. And, um, man, here he comes. The man of faith and power is on the scene. Yeah, the world's been waiting for me. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're, there's this, this, you know, this, this zeal. And then you come out and you go, you go back to alumni week and you got people you went to school with. They're pastoring churches. They're traveling. They got traveling ministries. And what are you doing? Yep. You get to preach about three times a year. You're mopping the floors. You're working in the nursery. Hello, you're going to the pastor's house and feeding his dog when he's out of town. Hello, you know, you're walking the, the, them in in the rat of the rain so you don't, they don't get wet. You're getting drenched, but they don't get wet. And, and you don't, you, listen, you don't disdain what you're doing. But somewhere in there, because you just so expected that you were going to be in ministry. 
you stop going to meetings where people that you know are going to be there so you don't have to tell them you're not Mr. Glorious Preacher Man. You're ashamed. You're ashamed. And you go along with that pattern. You go along with that life. So you're cooking chickens at Parker's. Aren't you glad I learned how to cook chickens and make barbecue? Aren't you glad I, I stayed until I knew how to do it all? Can I, can I get a show of hands? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sean gave two hands up. All right. Uh, I think Bill threw his foot up. I almost kicked the computer off. Um, and so I'm going along like this. And, man. <clears throat> um, and some of y'all have heard this story before, but you know, after after all this, you know, my and my pastor kept coming to me saying, "Listen, you're in a, like you're doing the work of an assistant. As soon as we can afford it, I'm going to hire you as my assistant pastor." Okay, you know, carrots out there, <laughs> like the mule with the stick over its head with the carrot hanging on it. You just tie the back stack to the yoke and hang it out there in front of him. That, that mule will walk all day trying to get to that carrot. Unless you got too close to the cornfield and he's got the carrot and got the corn. You didn't want that. Green corn and a mule. You truck from the back of a cart. They, they had upset stomachs. It was not a pretty sight. <laughs> All right. And um, so one day he comes to me and goes, you know, we're ready. How much notice do you need to give here at work? I said, two weeks. He said, okay, well, um, I'm going to pray about it a little bit more this weekend and, you know, um, but ready to hire you. Oh, great. Go to the church weekend. I mean, I'm flying. I'm floating on a cloud. I'm so excited. Why? Because of an external thing. See, which I really thought was internal, but I found out it was external. Ministry, the status of being in ministry, having cards with the Reverend Edward A. Taylor on them. Hello? I've got cards now for the first time I've had in like years because, you know, the kids wanted to get cards. I have cards. So, it was, okay. It's because they put QR codes on them and all that kind of stuff. Really cool. Okay. But it's the first time I've had business cards in, in ten, 10 years or more. You outgrow some stuff, you know. And um, I, boy, this is great going to work at the church, waiting for him to come by and tell. He shows up at work on Monday. And I'm thinking, he's, here's the news. Here it is. Glory to God. My day has come. All right, here I am. And he, he says, uh, can you talk? Yeah. So I, I walked, you know, walked out of the kitchen, walked outside, and he said, well, he said, uh, you know, I was on the platform on Sunday, and um, we were worshiping, and um, the Lord spoke to me and said, why well, haven't you concern, uh, considered my servant so-and-so? Wasn't me. Went out, took him to lunch, and hired him. On the spot. Yeah. Boom. So you're not getting to work at the church. You talk about crush. I went in there. I took off work. I went home and wept for an hours. I was crushed. I mean, crushed. I mean, I had a hard time. I had a very difficult time. But why did I have a difficult time? Because I had put all my dreams and hopes in getting hired. That was an external thing. Instead of following out the plan of God. It wasn't necessarily that it was, it, it was the plan of God. It was, this is, this is the day. This is, you know, this is what I want, you know. And, and Buddy came to me. He came, in, you know, but Buddy Harrison came to the church. We were connected with him. And um, he, he, I was in the office with him. He said, son, he said, you're doing the right thing at the right time in the right place. God's building root in you so that when he uproots you from here and puts you somewhere else, you'll be able to withstand the transplant. What wisdom? Because I was ready to quit. I was ready to leave. I was ready to quit. I'd have missed God. I said I would have missed God a thousand miles. But at that time, I, all I could see was Mighty Casey had struck out. There was no joy in Mudville. I mean, it was terrible. I, I, was, I was just living in a devastated time frame. And uh, he spoke that to me, and it gave me, it gave me strength, that wisdom. It really did. 
I mean, if, if y'all don't know who, you know, Buddy, all those Harris the House books, those are his, that was his publishing company, okay? Um, Buddy was just, a, was, a, was a gem, just a gem. Love him. And still love him. Sister Pat's still out there. He married Brother Hagin's daughter, Pat, who's, who's a Holy Ghost woman, I'm going to tell you right now. And um, truer words over my life have never been spoken. Because if it had not been for the root that God developed in me when I transplanted here, I'd have been gone a long time ago. We would have filed bankruptcy as a church, left town, and gone somewhere else and missed God. And missed God. Are you hearing me? And missed God. God. But I'll never forget. Um, I got hired six months before we came here. No, a year. A year before we came and moved here, I went on staff full time there. No, it was six months. It was six months. That's right. It was March of that year, 80, 87. I got hired at church full time. Now, of course, he told everybody in church I was the part-time janitor, part-time assistant pastor. Why do you have to say that? Why? What, what's, 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 we're having an assistant pastor. And if some of you do, this is clean church. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to dress it up, you know, dress it down or whatever. Justify it. So, um, where was I going? That January of that year, came into a new year. You know how we're always looking for New Year's resolutions and all that kind of stuff. Came in, and uh, I was talking with Janie, because, you know, she's watched, she's watched me go through all this. And a good wife loves you, and she wants you to be, you know, fulfilled, wants you to do what it's in your heart to do and all that. And she's a good wife. And I looked at her, and I said, if I sit in this church for the rest of my life and do what I'm doing, I will be happy, and I will do it as unto the Lord. <clears throat> yep. I got hired two months later. Was here. Here ever since. Gone through some stuff, but we because we were, we learned a long time ago that the world's definition of success and the desire for material things doesn't outweigh the contentment of being in the will of God. Hold up. Has it always been easy? No. But we had to go back to what we knew. And that is obeying God and being in His will is more valuable than being Comfortable, happy, possessions. And today, there is so much happening right now at this place. It's hard to even, there are happening in the spirit. There's just, there's just things going on. We would have missed God. I traveled the world because I didn't, I didn't quit. I didn't give in to the material thing back before I ever moved here. I don't know where I would have ended up. I don't want to even think about where I could have ended up. We could have been divorced. We could have been shipwrecked. We could have been another casualty of disappointment in ministry. And you had to, had to learn that my joy cannot, and my, my identity cannot come from what I do, but, for who, but from whom I live for and serve and am in union with. That's where it comes from. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's take up an offering. That was, a, that was the abridged version of that story. Glory to God. You know, offering envelope, raise your, oh, not raise your hand. Look on the seat backs in front of you. Hallelujah. They're right there. Uh, if you're giving electronically, go ahead and get that ready and ching ching it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can give online. Cash app, dollar sign, Expedition Triad. 
there is no space. I know we have it on the graphic. There's an X, there's a dollar sign in there, but that's not that's not accurate. I mean, there is a dollar sign, but there's no space. Okay, it's 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 straight there. And then PayPal is give at expeditiontriad.org. Amen. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the tithers, we bless the givers. Thank you that you open up heaven's windows and empty on them blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go ahead, Brother Joe, take the in-house offering. Glory to God. rest of you can send it through Cash App. Glory to God. Now, hallelujah. Those who are watching tonight, thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, staying with us as we, as we minister the Word of God. We trust you are blessed abundantly. And join us next time. Join us this Sunday for the guest special guest speaker. We have a missionary from the Middle East, North Africa region going to be with us. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm hoping we'll be able to broadcast live. Uh, check in. We'll let you know for sure because uh, he, he may say, well, I, can't, I don't need to broadcast live to share some stuff. Um, when you're in certain parts of the world, you just can't share everything publicly on inter media because it's being monitored. Okay? And we don't want, we don't want you know, to mess up what he's doing because somebody's monitoring. He goes, ah, oh, get him next time he comes in the country. So we don't want that. Amen? All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Church.